It said that the congregation would sing louder as the train loads full of Jews were being hauled off to the concentration camps and to their deaths. That as the train would pass, the singing would increase in volume just so as to cover up the sounds of the screams of the people being hauled off to their deaths. And while the church would get loud in this regard to cover up what was happening right around them, what was largely silent was the pulpits and addressing the wickedness of socialism as it arose and as the Nazis came to power throughout Germany. Dietrich Bonhoeffer found himself feeling like a lone voice calling for uprightness in the church and for the Christians to acknowledge the moment and see what is happening, but pulpits acquiesced. Pastors were afraid of offending, and so they didn't. And now, because of their silence to this day, the German church bears that burden. Today, we are a church plant in the most atheistic city in the least church state in the U.S. This is a moment. This is an opportunity. This is where you have been placed by the sovereignty of God for such a time as this one. And you have been invested in by the king. You have been given gifts by his Holy Spirit, abilities that serve a greater purpose even than your own self-interest, abilities, talents given by the Holy Spirit that interconnect and complement the other spiritual gifts of other members of the Redemption Church. And this calling, this opportunity, this timing was all foreknown by our sovereign God. We're in the Gospel of Luke. Here is a QR code that you can scan. I have numerous verses of context before we get into the parable of the minas and the overturning of the tables in the temple, one of multiple table overturnings that Jesus would, would, would perform in his ministry. We have to have words of context to, to really appreciate what Jesus is giving in this parable because it's very rich. We've gone verse by verse to the gospel of Matthew. Raise your hand if you were with us when we went through Matthew. It's great, right? Now in the gospel of Matthew, we saw the parable of the talents. This is a different parable. It uses a different currency, a different, different form of legal tender, a different kind of money and different increments with different returns. And it, it comes as the cross approaches. In the multiple chapters of Luke that we've gone through so far, we've flown through uh, the opening of the Christmas story, which we studied at Christmas, but then years fly by. You cover like three years in, in, in 20 chapters. And in the final chapters of Luke, much like, much like the gospel of John, suddenly time slows way down as you approach the end of the gospel. What Luke's gospel bears as a distinctive among the other gospels is that he zooms in hard on Jesus's journey toward Jerusalem. Now we've stopped at Jericho and he has met a man named Zacchaeus. He is short in stature, all right? I can relate. And he wants to see Jesus and everybody hates his guts. But Jesus makes a statement about Zacchaeus that we really only know about one other guy in all of scripture. He makes the proclamation that salvation has come to Zacchaeus' house. And we see Zacchaeus' repentance. And we see a tone set for a series of teachings, including the parable of the Minas. In Zacchaeus, there is corrupt capitalism because he collects taxes from his fellow Jews, and he does so on behalf of the Roman Empire, and he does so at an exorbitant rate. He defrauds people. But then there's repentance in Zacchaeus. And then we have the parable of the Minas, which we'll go through verse by verse. And then you have this corrupt capitalization on people's worship in the temple, which Jesus completely 
upends. In the parable of the Minas, there is historical context, which I'll give you about Archelaus, a story that was fresh on people's minds only 30 years prior to the events of this teaching. It was readily apparent that the parallels Jesus drew from were understood instantly by everybody to whom he spoke. So there, there's, historical, there's historical context, but there's also apocalyptic context. We are appointed a judgment day. We will give an account to God for everything that we've done. And our deadline is imminent yet unknowable. And because it's unknowable, we must act as though it is constantly possibly imminent. And that's by design. Here's 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each may be repaid for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. This is describing the Bema seat of judgment. Bema is a large platform from which a judge would stand and give an adjudication. We must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Romans chapter 14, verse 10. But you, why do you judge your brother or sister? Or you, why do you despise your brother or sister? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow to me and every tongue will give praise to God. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. Also, Romans chapter eight, verse one, therefore there is now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. What's remarkable is that Christians will not stand in judgment for our sins. Isn't that good news? Christians will not stand in judgment for our sins. Christ has taken upon himself to the cross the full atoning work for every last one of our sins. And Romans 8, 1 leaves us with this beautiful, incredible hope. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. John chapter five, verse 24. Truly I tell you, anyone who hears my word and believes him uh, who sent me has eternal life and will not come under judgment, but has passed from death to life. Do you see how critical this, these words are? Christians will not stand in judgment for our sins. That judgment has already been made. That adjudication has been proclaimed. It is finished, declares Jesus. All right, look at this. We will not, say these words with me, Redemption Church, come under judgment. We will not come under judgment for our sin. Now, is this talking about everybody in the world? No. Look, it says, truly, I tell you, anyone who hears my word and believes in him who sent me, Believers then in Jesus Christ as Lord will not come under judgment for our sins. Look, I am coming soon and my reward is with me to repay each person according to his work. Instead, believers stand before the Bema seat of judgment. And this is like being officially pardoned for everything that you have done because the payment for sin has been made in full by Christ on the cross. And so if there is a cataloging of every last sin you've ever committed, it is marked tetelestai, paid in full by the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. This is the Bema seat of judgment, but there is a great white throne judgment. And that is the judgment before which everyone who is not in Christ, everyone who has rejected Jesus must stand and face him in this. Meanwhile, believers before the Bema seat have promised rewards from God. It is absolutely incredible to behold. There are multiple crowns. Here's the crown of righteousness. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8. There is reserved for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day, and not only to me, but to all those who have loved his appearing. So there's a crown of righteousness. There's also a crown of life. Blessed is the one who endures trials because when he has stood the test he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him who here is enduring a trial and you're working on your crown of life right now does that give you hope blessed are you when you endure trials because when you have stood the test there's only one way to receive this and that's the hard way when you have stood the test you receive the crown of life this is so much better than the full consequences for our sins isn't it christian Wow, 
there's also, there's also this crown of unfading glory. This is Revelation 2.10. Don't be afraid of what you are about to suffer. Look, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison to test you and you will experience affliction for 10 days. Be faithful to the point of death and I will give you the crown of what, Redemption Church? Life. So there, there, are, there are promised blessings for Christians as we stand before what is referred to as the Bema Seat judgment. And there are crowns of life, crowns of righteousness, crowns of unfading glory that are promised to all those who are, who are faithful to God. Here's, here's 1 Peter chapter 5, uh, verse 4. And when the chief shepherd appears, that's Jesus, you will receive the crown of unfading glory. So there are crowns promised as rewards. Isn't that incredible that though you and I deserve the cross, instead we would receive crowns. Man, I am so grateful for the grace, aren't you? So this apocalyptic prophecy about the Bema Seat judgment for those who are in Christ is, is needed to fully understand what's happening. But there's also, there's also the, the great white throne judgment. And it's so named because of Revelation chapter 20, verse 11. Then I saw a great white throne. This is where the, this is where the term comes from. A great white throne and one seated on it. Earth and heaven fled from his presence and no place was found for them. I also saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne and the books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by what was written in the books. Then the sea gave up the dead uh, that, that were in it and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. Each one was judged according to their works. Death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. Anyone who, uh, whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. So Jesse, what happens to the person who lives his whole life and never hears the name of Jesus? What about the people in countries where Christianity, Christian missionaries haven't made it? They don't have a Bible in their language yet. What happens to these people? When they live their whole lives, they never are able to call upon the name of the Lord because we didn't get to them in time or because they killed our missionaries that were trying to reach them. What happens to these people who live their whole lives without the name of Jesus? When they die, do they go to hell? This text says that they are judged according to their works. Now, what has every single one of us done? Sinned. Every single one of us has sinned. No one is righteous, not even one. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And there's no other name under heaven by which we can be saved. And so this is something we've talked about already once before. This is something that can either crush you under the weight of it or in a colossally fallacious non sequitur, you can choose to just storm out of the church right now because my answer to this question will make you so mad at me personally and you go and sharpen your ad hominem attacks and write mean things about me. You can do that, but it won't change anything. Do these people who die without Jesus go to hell? The answer is yes. Now, what are you prepared to do, Christian? You see, that can either crush you or it can shape every breath you take. And it can motivate you like nothing else. Romans chapter 10 answers this question. How can they call upon the God they've not believed in? And how can they believe unless they hear? How can they hear unless someone preaches to them? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As Isaiah prophesied, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the gospel of peace. Paul answered this question for us. How can they call on the God they've not believed in? Now, what are you prepared to do, Christian? You happen to be right on the front lines of the front lines of church planting, of the move of the Holy Spirit, and the world's most powerful country <laughs> for now. You happen to be, by the sovereignty of God, right on the front lines in the only financially solvent church plant in our area that's been able to make it of our class of the last few years. And you are in the most atheistic city in the U.S. This is it. These are the front lines. This is Omaha Beach on D-Day, as far as church planters are concerned. When seminaries, 
prepare pastors to go plant churches. They tell them not to come here because this is where church plants go to die, but not the redemption church, amen? I see it. I see the redemption church making its budget each year. And I, I have exciting news to share as we conclude the revival project, our building campaign. Our task force has a couple of leads. Be praying for Mark Hermler as he has surgery today. But I see a church plant that has been faithful, that is growing, that is making disciples who are making disciples. This is the front row right here. This is actually the front row because I can see your faces and I can see you guys and I know the stories and I can see the faces of people who are here because of other faces that are here and those people are here because of other faces that are here. I see disciples who are making disciples who are making disciples. There are people that my small group prayed for that they would come to Christ and now we're praying for the people that those people have led to Christ. We pray, for, we pray for people to be saved. Now those people are saved and they're sharing the gospel with other people. And that's how our church is growing. Isn't that amazing, Redemption Church? Here you are on the front lines. What are you prepared to do? The great white throne judgment is imminent for the vast majority of the people of Seattle who will die without Jesus. You don't have to get on a plane to go on a mission trip. My childhood church would pray over us before we went on a mission trip that had only a 60% Christian population, okay? In this town where 85% of people would profess to know Jesus, anywhere you went that was under 85% professing Christ was considered this dark spiritual warfare territory. And so parents would come and lay hands on their teenagers to prepare them to go on this trip. What is it here? Is it the perfect mirror image of that? 15% of the population professes to even believe in God at all, but within that 15%, there are lumped together various faith systems, right? There are, in that same 15%, there are Mormons, there are Jews, there are Jehovah's Witnesses, Islam is part of it. So really, truly, we are most analogous to a Baptist church and this town is 1.9% Baptist. <laughs> That's the real nature of things. If you want to look at it doctrinally or denominationally, that is the denomination we most closely align with. We're like a Baptist church with some charismatic tendencies, which I like. And that's, that means we're Baptists who believe in 1 Corinthians 14. Right, we, we, are, we are most like the Baptist church. And if that's the case, we represent about 1% of the population. If you choose to think, think of it denominationally. But this is the reality. You have an opportunity. There are Christians in the deep South who covet the chance that you have every morning when you wake up, when you go to work, when you talk with your neighbors, when you go to the grocery store. This is why my family lives here. Do you understand? In the deep South, you, there was an obstacle in the way of evangelism. You had to convince someone that they were lost before they could actually be saved. That's not an issue here. People who are lost know that they're lost and they're ironically quite, quite proud of their lostness. This is the most fertile mission field in the US as far as I see it. This is then a coveted opportunity. This is where SEAL Team 6 Christians want to be. This is where the most hardcore and fearless church planters all want to be. They want what you have because every day you wake up and you step out of your house and you have an opportunity that they crave. You have more evangelistic opportunity than anyone else in the United States. Do you see it? This is where the fish are jumping. This is where everybody wants to be. And everyone who dies without Jesus will face the great white throne judgment. Christians will face the Bema seat, receive crowns of glory, crowns of righteousness, crowns of life. But everyone who is not in Christ will be judged according to their works. And there's no other name under heaven by which we can be saved this is critical. This is absolutely critical. There is something dawning as Jesus gives this parable, likely still by Zacchaeus' house, by the way. 
There is a coming church age, which the Pharisees had no concept of. They had no knowledge of. They were more concerned about the impending enemies of Israel as they would all close in. They had no idea that the church age was coming. They missed the spiritual significance of Jesus' message and they would interpret it immediately, politically, militarily. They would interpret Jesus' teachings falsely. They would miss what was really coming. At the end of this church age, there is that victory that they crave for Israel. Jesus will take his church home Right now in the church age, Messianic Jews and Christians alike are one people. And then Jesus will bring his church home and he will reign from Jerusalem for 1,000 years, defeating all of Israel's enemies for 1,000 years. And this then approaching church age in which the Gentiles and Jews would come together, this this was a mystery that was being revealed to them at the time. They couldn't yet fully grasp all of this. Here's Ephesians chapter three, verse one through six. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming you have heard about the administration of God's grace that he gave me for you, the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have briefly written above. By reading this, you are able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ. This was not made known to people in other generations as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the spirit. The Gentiles are co-heirs, members of the same body and partners in the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. This is the church age. That is the mystery made known, but it was completely lost on the Pharisees who heard Jesus's parable. They didn't understand it eternally. They wanted to interpret it through what they could see, what was tangible, what was immediate, what was now, what was monetary. They wanted their own political goals met now. They wanted the kingdom of God to bring about military victory, political victory for Israel, for their generation right then and there. And what they missed was the scope of the original covenant that was made between God and Abraham at the very founding of Israel, that every nation of the earth would be blessed through Abraham. God had something far broader in mind than merely one political win for one generation for one nation. He has the ultimate victory for all those who are in Christ from every nation for all time. Second Corinthians chapter four, verse 16. Therefore, we do not give up. Even though our outer person is being destroyed, our inner person is being renewed day by day for our momentary light affliction is producing for us an absolutely incomparable eternal weight of glory. So we do not focus on what is seen, but on, what on, um, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. All right, the things that you cannot see matter so much more than everything that you can see. Everything that you can see is subject to entropy and it's losing electrons as you observe it. But the things that you cannot see are impervious to entropy and they last forever. They matter forever. Do not make the same mistake as the Pharisees and miss the eternal significance of Jesus' teaching. So here is the parable of the Minas. As they were listening to this, he went on to tell a parable because he was near Jerusalem and they thought the kingdom of God was going to appear right away. See what I'm saying? In route to Jerusalem, They are all trying to interpret Jesus' teachings for the immediacy of their political interests. Therefore, he said, a nobleman traveled to a far country to receive for himself authority to be king and then to return. He called 10 of his servants, gave them 10 minas, and told them, engage in business until I come back. Okay, see, this is where you can begin to see the apocalyptic significance of this teaching until I come back. Now, this was all heavy on people's minds. It was relevant to their setting because there was this son of Herod named Archelaus, all right? Uh, Herod the Great died and his kingdom was to be distributed among his sons. One of his sons was Archelaus and Archelaus would be the one who would preside over Judea. Now, Soon after the death of Herod the Great, 
Archelaus immediately got into conflict with his own Jewish constituents. And in fact, there are some conflicting reports as I read various historical accounts of the matter. They say that some, in some cases, they say that there was this golden eagle that Herod the Great had put over the doorway to the temple. This was defiling the temple. This was grotesquely out of place. It would be wildly inappropriate for the government to come in and say, you're gonna put this statue that we want on top of your church. So about 40 young Jewish men and a couple of elders took the eagle down. And then to make an example of them, they were set on fire. They were publicly immolated for what they had done. This led to incredible grief and tension. Then at Passover, some say that there was a retaliatory strike carried out by some of the Jewish people. Nonetheless, what resulted was an absolute massacre as the Jews were worshiping and carrying out the observance of Passover in Jericho, 3,000 of them were slaughtered by Archelaus's demand. Now, Archelaus had to go stand before the emperor to be crowned king, as was stipulated in the will of his father, Herod the Great. Herod the Great had altered his will shortly before his death. And so this stipulation had to be seen after. Archelaus has been, by the decree of the will of his father, told to go to a faraway country, that would be Rome, from Jericho to Rome is quite a long ways away, to receive his crown and then come back. Do you guys see the parallels between the premise of the parable of the Minas and the story of Archelaus that was just 30 years prior? Now, when Archelaus stood before the emperor, he was represented, I believe, by Tiberius, who himself would, would be a successor and eventually one day Caesar himself. And while he's given this account before Caesar to receive the crown that was promised him, there's this delegation of 50 Jews who also show up at Rome. And they say, this guy cannot possibly rule over us. He's a genocidal maniac. He slaughtered 3,000 of his own people. You cannot crown him king. And so in a demotion, but still respecting the will of Herod the Great, he was made ethnarch, meaning this king over the people of a certain ethnicity. So he's king, sort of. He's king, but not fully. And so then, uh, then Archelaus would have to return to Judea. And then eventually, after nine or 10 years on the throne, he would eventually be overthrown. And then that vacuum of power left by the, 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 the deposition of Archelaus would create, it would create the office that would later be occupied by Pontius Pilate. It would create a vacuum in the government. And so the Romans would appoint this new office and Pontius Pilate would take it, and then Pontius Pilate would preside over one aspect of the sham of the trial that would lead to the crucifixion of Jesus. So the whole story of Archelaus is heavy on everybody's minds. Okay, do you see the parallels? He's by the Father's will told to go to a faraway country to receive his crown and come back. That is the exact premise of the parable of the Minas. Jesus was speaking to people with readily relatable historical context. So we, likewise, we find ourselves in the position of the servants. It's fascinating that Jesus would posit himself in his own parable in the archetype set by a murderous maniac, that he would fill the role of Archelaus, that he is the one by the will of his father to go to a faraway country to receive his crown and then return. It's striking. But we have also received something from our king. We have been given an investment that we are expected to risk. We are expected to utilize, to capitalize. And if we don't risk, if we don't capitalize, if we don't bear fruit with what has been sown into us, then we prove ourselves not to be servants at all. 
1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse seven. A manifestation of the spirit is given to each person for the common good. To one is given a message of wisdom through the spirit. To another, a message of knowledge by the same spirit. To another, faith by the same spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one spirit. To another, the performing of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between spirits. To another, different kinds of tongues. To another, interpretation of tongues. One and the same spirit is active in all these distributing to each person as he wills. So we are the servants, he is the king. The gifts of the spirit are that investment, those minas, if you will, in the context of the Luke parable. Here's verse 14. But his subjects hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we don't want this man to rule over us. Raise your hand if you see the parallels between that and the story of Archelaus. Just like Archelaus, there was this delegation of 50 Jews that went to Caesar and said, this guy cannot be our king. So he's king, like it or not. His subjects hate him, like it or not. He's still the one in charge. Verse 15, at his return, having received the authority to be king, he summoned those servants he had given the money to so that he could find out how much they had made in business. Archelaus built aqueducts in Jericho. He constructed for himself an opulent palace. All the remnants of Archelaus's rule were all around them. They would have readily understood the reference that Jesus was making. So when you know that he has been given the crown and he has the authority and he's coming back to rule, it instills fear in your heart. Everybody was nervous when word traveled back to Jericho that Archelaus did receive his crown and he is coming back. He will preside over us. What do you do in the meantime? That nervousness that you feel at an impending deadline, that's, what's caused, that, that's, what this, that's how this parable causes us to bear fruit. It spurs us on to inaction. It motivates us to reject passivity to stop procrastinating the things of God, the will of God, the ministry of the gospel, the use of our gifts in the Holy Spirit. His subjects hated him. They sent a delegation after him saying, we don't want this man to rule over us. Verse 15, at his return, having received authority to be king, he summoned those servants he had given the money to so that he could find out how much they had made in business. You've got to give an account before the king. All those who are in Christ stand before the Bema seat judgment. All those who are without Christ, everyone who rejects Jesus stands before the great white throne judgment. And in all things, we must stand before the king. The first came forward and said, master, your mina has earned 10 more minas. That is an incredible return. That's a thousand percent return on the investment, isn't it? It's amazing. That's amazing. Well done, good servant, he told him. Because you've been faithful in a very small matter, have authority over 10 towns. It's remarkable. It's remarkable. So we could see the apocalyptic connotations here that the king has returned and then he is giving away authority. He has invested in this servant. The first one came forward and said, Master, your mina has earned 10 more minas. Well done, good servant, because you have been, everybody say this word with me right now, say it, faithful. That's the operative word in understanding the results. As the king speaks to each of his servants, they come stand before him in this foreshadowing of the Bema seat. They are, they are commended for their faithfulness or punished for their lack of faithfulness. So he has one mina, he turns it into 10. Well done, good servant, because you have been faithful in a very small matter, have authority over 10 towns. I see as well like a foreshadowing of the millennial reign of Christ in this parable. In apocalyptic prophecy, you're gonna see that Jesus gives authority to his people and that there are glorified saints that reign alongside Christ right there in Jerusalem for 1,000 years. This is his blessing. It's authority. This is your reward. You get your own degree of sovereignty. This servant has authority over 10 towns. You're welcome. Have 10 cities. Good job. This is your reward. Your dominion is increased. Your authority is expanded. 
This is all, this is, this is how, this is how the Bema seat judgment will work, right? The king is coming back. We'll have to give an account for everything that we have done with what he has given us. I pray that you are ready. I pray that you are ready to give an account, that you'll be able to show God this fruit that has been born by the use of your spiritual gifts. And as a reward, what you receive then is authority, is dominion. Look at Revelation chapter five, verse eight. When he took the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp and golden bowls filled with incense, which are the prayers of the saints. I'll preach about that all day long. He has heard your every prayer. And they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slaughtered and you purchased people for God by your blood from every tribe and language and people and nation. (laughs) I got your DEI training right here. God did it. God made it. God shed his own blood, purchased people by the blood of Christ from every tribe, every language, every people and every nation. You made them a kingdom and priests to our God and they will, what Redemption Church? Reign on the earth. This is, this is how God blesses his servants. This, is, this gives us a glimpse into heaven. My son Asher was asking me like, what are we gonna do in heaven? Well, we will, we will reign. We will glorify God. We will, we will put Elon Musk to shame for his lack of imagination and space exploration. We will see the fallout from original sin removed and we'll see creation as it was always intended to have been. We will see true beauty, that of Eden, uncorrupted by sin. And home base will be a colossal heavenly city with 12 gates made out of solid pearl each. And they will be open night and day because there's no, there's no need for defensive measures. This rather is home base. And then for eternity, you're given this dominion. Isn't that exactly how it started? Do you remember how God created everything and it was good? And he created man in his own image. And man is given dom- dominion over the plants, over the animals. This is what God has done since the very beginning. This is not a novel idea. This is how things end and it's similar to how they began. Only as it ends, it is perfected and it is eternally sin-proof. So we've got one servant who came and was able to produce 10 minas with his investment. Here's verse 18. The second came and said, Master, your mina has made five minas. So he said to him, you will be over five towns. All right, so we can see that this, this reward is commensurate with his faithfulness. The second servant's reward is in proportion to his faithfulness. And then there, there it is again, all right, that, that faithfulness is what is rewarded. So the first guy produces 10, receives dominion over 10 towns. The second produces five. You will reign over five towns. And so it's in proportion to what was given and what was yielded. Now look at verse 20, because this, now this is, where, this, is where things, this is where things change. And another came and said, Master, here is your mina. I have kept it safe in a cloth because I was afraid of you. Since you're a harsh man, you collect what you didn't deposit and reap what you didn't sow. Let's talk about this. So the harsh man bit you can imagine may have some historical connotations to Archelaus, okay? But it's also an indictment of the master. Now, this, to me, smacks of covetousness, and it's a sentiment that exists today. This is something that exists today. You collect what you didn't deposit. Yeah, that's called, you know, being a good investor. <laughs> that's, that means that it worked, you did deposit something and then you want to withdraw more than you initially deposited. That's called a profit. So is it biblically wise? Is it justified? Is it good to earn a profit from your work? Absolutely it is. 
If you start a food truck, okay, and you are able to make some incredible jambalaya with your food truck, you're able to track down some decent on Dewey, which is hard to do around here, and you're able to even import some shrimp from the Gulf of Mexico. And you take your time with what they call the holy trinity of, of Creole and Cajun cooking. You slice the celery extra fine. And you have the perfect technique when you cut the bell pepper. And obviously you've got to use onions. You've got, you must use onions. You'll get a ticket if you don't use onions. It's necessary. And then the garlic. Yeah. Okay, you straight up good fellas style slice that garlic until it becomes liquid in the pot. And you have mastered that technique and you are patient. All right, you save your ingredients until that caramelization is just right. You've seen this before? Okay, where are some of our bachelor guys? Where are you guys at? All right, look, this will impress a woman if you can caramelize garlic and onions. Okay. Get it going with olive oil and with the onions and with the minced garlic, all right? That's, that's, that's one thing. But if you really want to glorify God, then you straight up take the cloves out and you slice them thin, okay? Put them over there with some herbs, a little bit of Creole seasoning, and then lower the heat, man. Lower the heat, okay? Let it sit there. Keep it stirred. And then something, something outright miraculous just happens in that saucepan. Who knows what I'm talking about, right? When you caramelize, suddenly it becomes sweet, doesn't it? It's incredible. Now we can get into all the things that are happening right there biologically, but, but here's, here's the effect that it's gonna have. You're gonna come across like a good cook, okay? All right, so single Christian women, if you're looking for the single Christian guys, they're here. Take a close look at our band when they get up because you might think to yourself, Jesse tells all these single Christian women to come to the Redemption Church, but I have this suspicion that they're all a bunch of ugly basement dwelling troglodytes. Like, no, these are good looking guys. Aren't they Redemption Church? Okay, so... They're good looking guys, okay? They're gamefully employed. They're doing well. They're really smart. They're great musicians and they're gonna learn how to cook for you. <laughs> you guys are on the hook now. So you start your food truck and you put time into it. The results of all that time, of that know-how, that experience, okay? You tasted grandmother's jambalaya. You watched little mom make jambalaya and now you have perfected that recipe over time yourself. It's worth more than the sum of the cost of the ingredients because you've made something new. You've added value with your skill. And so even though you may have only spent a buck 50 on the ingredients, what you produce is absolutely worth 50 bucks if you do it well enough. And if you taste good jambalaya, the kind of jambalaya that improves your walk with Jesus, you know what I'm talking about. What was the difference between, what was the catalyst between just the raw ingredients and you? It was you and it was your skill. Moreover, you're the one who fronted the money for the food truck. You bought the pan. You bought the ingredients. You're the one who spent the whole day making giant pots of jambalaya, taking the risk that nobody would buy anything. Risk is absolutely inherent to this parable. Risk and stewardship capitalism are directly proportional to reward. The wicked lazy servant is called wicked and lazy because he took no risk at all. He took the mini he was given, he folded it in a cloth and he just hid it. He concealed it. Are you the undercover Christian at your workplace? Okay, any, any day now, feel free to blow your own cover and come out as a Christian because you stand the risk of just taking the gospel, wrapping it in a cloth and hiding it and then giving an account before Jesus when he comes back. You took no risk. You didn't even try. You concealed the one thing that would save your coworkers. Don't take the gospel and conceal it and hide it and go undercover. Take a risk. Let it be known that you're a Christian. Let it be known. And then trust God with the results. Capitalism seems to be a theme, not only in the story of Zacchaeus as an example of corrupt capitalism, this as an example of spiritual stewardship capitalism, but then even as spiritual capitalism goes awry and is corrupted again at the end, Jesus is gonna overturn the table. So capitalism is like this theme throughout the text. 
the thought process of the wicked and the lazy servant is a thought process that still exists today. Now, I think that this is someone who's not saved. He is fruitless. He has borne no fruit with what has been invested in him. And we see in the book of James that faith, if it's not accompanied by actions, is useless. It's dead. Can such a faith save you? That faith is dead that bears no fruit, accompanied by zero actions at all. This does not mean that we are saved by works. It means that because we're saved, we are going to perform works. We're going to actually do something. We're going to have something to show for our faith. Otherwise, our faith is dead. So any day now, undercover Christian, feel free to blow your own cover. Otherwise, you run the risk of being the wicked and lazy servant who concealed what was given to him and hid it. That's taking zero risk. Risk is inherent within capitalism and within spiritual fruitfulness. The two are inextricably linked. The owner of the food truck who fronted the money for the truck, bought the ingredients, put in the time, added his skill, is absolutely entitled to profit from the risk that he has taken. But when he is successful in our day, in our age, people who covet the profits, who covet the success, will insult him. Hang on a second, that's not fair. How dare you charge that much for your jambalaya when the ingredients only cost this much? Within the Old Testament, we see the biblical model given for someone who owns his own means of production and is able to profit from what he produces. Proverbs 31 describes the ideal woman. She is the personification of wisdom herself. And one of the things that her husband loves about her is that she's able to sell her wares for a profit. She's able to sell merchandise at, with a profit margin to it. She's able to produce something that is of greater value because she has taken the risk and she has used her skill and now she has reaped a reward. She has earned a profit because of what she has done. This is a biblical precedent. Now consider the capitalism of God and you are his steward. He has given you his Holy Spirit. He has given you gifts. And the expectation is that you would then reap the rewards. This is where you get franchises. This is the next level. And it's counterintuitive. It's counterintuitive. Right? The idea of managers who just do nothing but you know, manage people. There's a growing sentiment in my generation and the younger generation too to look at managers and be like, man, they don't actually do anything. They just oversee people. You know, like when's the last time you got down here and swung a hammer? All you do is sit in that office and you oversee the people who produce the results. And some of that is motivated by sheer jealousy because you wish you had that cushy office job. But if the boss man is the one who funded the whole operation, he's the one who's taking the risk here. And he's the one who loses everything if this job fails. Because of his risk, he is entitled to the profits that it earns. Now, in spiritual terms, we have been invested in by God. He expects a return. He expects us to produce results. If we produce no fruit, we bear no results from our faith. Are we the wicked and lazy servant? Look at the criticism leveled at the master by the wicked servant, by the lazy servant. He calls him a harsh man. This could harken back to Archelaus. You collect what you didn't deposit. Yeah, we call that having a successful return on your investment. And you reap what you didn't sow. Yeah, we call that delegation. This is what God does. He delegates. He allows his people dominion. And he allows his people a degree of his own sovereignty to reign over what he gives us. That's an eternal reward. That's the reward within the parable of the Minas. And he's just described him as a harsh man. Now look at how those words will be used to judge him. He will then be treated exactly as he expects to be. Verse 22, he told him, I will condemn you by what you have said, you evil servant. If you knew I was a harsh man, collecting what I didn't deposit and reaping what I didn't sow, why then didn't you put my money in the bank? And when I returned, I would have collected it with interest. It's true, right? There could have been some reward. There could have been some return here. This guy launches at the master. He calls him harsh. He resents him. And now he's judged by those same words. Isn't it re remarkable that Jesus has put himself 
as the harsh archetype, possibly stepping into the role that in everybody's minds as they originally hear this would be filled by Archelaus. He's done this before in the parable of the persistent widow. She is encouraged to continue pounding on the door demanding justice. And in the parable of the persistent widow, the whole point is, look, that widow is pleading with a corrupt judge who doesn't love God and doesn't care about people. And if that corrupt judge who doesn't love God and doesn't care about people will eventually acquiesce to this this woman's persistence, how much more will our sovereign, holy, good, just, loving God hear the cries of his people and answer you so you keep on pounding on the door to heaven. The whole point of that parable, this is Luke, uh, Luke chapter 18, verse six through eight. The whole point of that parable is that it's even stronger when you understand that you're not dealing with Archelaus. You're not dealing with a corrupt judge. You're dealing with Jesus. Luke 18, 6, then the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. Will not God grant justice to his elect who cry out to him day and night? Will he delay helping them? I tell you that he will swiftly grant them justice. Nevertheless, when the son of man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Now continue in the text, verse 24. So he said to those standing there, take a mina away from him and give it to the one who has 10 minas. But they said to him, master, he has 10 minas. I tell you that everyone who has, to everyone who has, more will be given. And from the one who does not have, even what he does have will be taken away. This is an economic reality, and it has played out every generation since. But bring here these enemies of mine who did not want me to rule over them and slaughter them in my presence. When he had said these things, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. So he's given the parable of the ten minas, likely outside of Zacchaeus' house. We've seen repentance from corrupt capitalism. We've seen a parable that draws upon their knowledge of Archelaus and then even uses stewardship capitalism as an example about God's expectations for his people. He would indict Israel, cause the fig tree to wither in a rather underspoken, understated miracle as an indictment for the fruitlessness of Israel. And now all that he's just taught in these opening verses is about to be proven prophetically true because he gives the parable about this one who has been crowned king and he's not welcomed, he's not wanted. And now he's about to ride into Jerusalem and the Pharisees are not going to want him. So it's prophetic in the opening verses. Here is the fulfillment in the subsequent verses. As he approached Bethpage and Bethany at the place called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of the disciples and said, go into the village ahead of you. As you enter it, you will find a colt tied there on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say this, the Lord needs it. The Lord needs it. There's a story there. There's a story there. Somebody received just this prophetic word from the Lord. There's something about this cult. And this guy walks up and starts taking it. And you're like, hey, where are you going with my donkey? And he says exactly what he was prepared prophetically to hear. The Lord needs it. Woo, goosebumps. He just got it. He understood. But we don't see the backstory. We can read between the lines. We can see like there was an interesting story behind that story, wasn't there? God was sovereignly at work. So those who were sent left and found it just as he told them. As they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, why are you untying the colt? The Lord needs it, they said. (laughs) That's the end of the story. So you notice what I'm saying? Read between the lines right here. There's, There's a story going on behind this story. Then they brought it to Jesus, and after throwing their clothes on the colt, they helped Jesus get on it. As he was going along, they were spreading their clothes on the road. This is to welcome a king. Now he came near the path down the Mount of Olives, and the whole crowd of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Some of the Pharisees from the crowd told him, teacher, rebuke your disciples. So here's Jesus coming into Jerusalem, receiving a king's welcome. 
And instead, he gets this condemnation. He gets this request that his own disciples would be silenced, that they would be, that they would be shut up. And so it's prophesied right there in the parable of the Minas. He is the king who comes back and is unwanted. He is the king who, is, who has a delegation expressing their own rejection of him. This is a proclamation to say peace in heaven and glory in highest heaven. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. This is a proclamation that Jesus fulfilled Psalm 118. This is an ancient text. So to see Jesus come in and to proclaim, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. They're saying that ancient Psalm that we've been singing our whole lives, it's about this moment. It's about Jesus. Jesus is the king. And then sure enough, just like in the parable of the Minas, you have that delegation. You have that, that group, some of the Pharisees who don't like it. He answered them, I tell you, if they were to keep silent, the stones would cry out. So even if people don't praise God, there will be worship. Even if no one sings about the glory of God, it doesn't mitigate the glory of God. God's not dependent upon our praise for his glory. His glory is given. Our praise is a reaction and it's a rightful reaction. He doesn't need your worship, but it's better for you and I if we do. Even if we don't sing, the stones will cry out in our place. And I will not have a stone taking my job, will you? As he approached and saw the city, he wept for it. Now, this is critical. This word, wept, this is a powerful word. This is, this is a poignant word. It's klahyo is the original Greek word. And it, it's often translated wept bitterly, like in Matthew 26, 75, and even wailing in Mark 5, 38. This is a deep grief. This is an intense expression of grief. So it's not like Jesus is Archelaus. He is the king and he is returning, but he loves Jerusalem. He loves these people and he is grief stricken over their fruitlessness and their corruption and their legalism. He's grieved over their rejection of him. He would say, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I long to draw you to myself the way that a mother hen draws in her chicks, but you were not willing. Jesus wept for Jerusalem. He has done everything that he can for them. And yet they are left to their own devices. If you reject Jesus, prepare to receive perfectly fair treatment in hell forever. You weren't cast there out of spite from God. You're cast there because you rejected the Savior. He drew upon you, but you chose darkness over light because your deeds are evil. You knew the truth of God, but you chose to suppress it to get away with sin. If you knew this day what would bring peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. For the days will come when your enemies will build a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side. They will crush you and your children among you to the ground and they will not leave one stone on another in your midst because you did not recognize the time when God visited you. In the year 70, this was fulfilled. Just a couple decades after Jesus makes this prophecy, in the year AD 70, that tension between the Roman authorities and the Jewish authorities just reached this fever pitch. And the Romans were convinced that there was gold inside the walls of the temple. And so brick by brick, motivated by greed, hunting for gold, they dismantled it. And Jesus's prophecy, both here in Luke 19 and also in Matthew 24, came absolutely true in the near-term fulfillment. Jesus wept over this. And the reason for it, is that they did not recognize the time when God visited them. My skeptical friend, do not fail to recognize the visit from God. Do not fail to recognize God's visit, the Holy Spirit's drawing upon your heart. He went into the temple and began to throw out those who were selling. And he said, it is written, my house will be a house of prayer, but you've made it a den of 
thieves. There were people who would have to travel a long way to be able to observe worship in the temple at Jerusalem, but you could not use coinage that had a pagan symbol on it while you're in the temple. So you had to exchange your Roman money for money that could be used as, at the temple. And these money changers would, ex, uh, would charge an exorbitant exchange rate, practically charging admission to church. Okay, like if here we are setting up like we do every Sunday, okay, like our team just sets up the drums and the mics and the keyboards and we set up the coffee in the back and we thank our coffee team, everybody, especially on Time Change Sunday. <laughs> By the way, yeah, if you just came in 30 minutes ago, welcome. It's Time Change Sunday. All right, uh, this is, uh, just imagine, imagine that we do our thing and then somebody else sets up too, somebody that we don't recognize, somebody that we don't know. And he has one of those turnstiles set up and it's an admission gate to get into the Redemption Church. He's like, that'll be 150 bucks. <laughs> and we're like, who are you? <laughs> and he's like, that'll be 150 bucks. <laughs> Starting to charge admission to come into the, to, to, to the church, to the house of God, which some people think is a movie theater throughout the week. Like, this, is, this is similar to what's happening here. They were, they were profiting off of people's need for proper currency. They were selling sacrifices, framing it as though it were a convenience, but in truth, robbing people because they are overcharging, over, overcharging. They were, they were going above and beyond. They had no interest in glorifying God, but they turned the house of God into a money-making venture. They were stealing from people. And so Jesus would just show up and throw their tables on their sides. Amen. All right, that's Jesus. See, just picture it. Throwing the table up, that's my Jesus. That's my God. That's what he did. That's righteous anger. That's righteous and just anger. Every day he was teaching in the temple. The chief priests, the scribes, and the leaders of the people were looking for a way to kill him. See that? They're not neutral. They're looking for a way to kill him, but they could not find a way to do it because the people were captivated by what they heard. This prophecy in the parable of the Minas, it is typified then and immediately what happens at the cleansing of the temple because he is the king who is not wanted by this delegation. He's received and gets a king's welcome, but there's those people who don't want him crowned because he is a strict king. He is righteous. He is holy. He is just, and he is good. We will stand before this king one day. He has gone to a faraway country to receive his crown and he is coming back again. And then you and I, his servants, must give an account when he comes back again. Do you have memory of an old school instructor or coach or a teacher who first day of class would just like put the fear of God into the whole group? And they're strict and you're nervous, but man, was there anything better than making that coach, that teacher, that instructor proud of you? Think about it. Hear the whistle. Hear the gruff voice in your head. I'm thinking of a couple of instructors. All right, but man, how good did it feel? How good did it feel? to produce results, receive that attaboy, receive that good job, receive that I'm proud of you, receive that diploma, receive that trophy, receive that medal. How good did it feel to please those strict instructors? There's a day coming when we'll stand before him and the fruitfulness of what we do is, is in his hands. What's expected of us is faithfulness. And what is spoken over the good and faithful servant is these words. This is, this is it. This is the goal. This is the hope. This is the dream. Well done. Well done. Good and faithful servant. You've proven yourself faithful with a few things. Now, you'll be entrusted with many things. That beautiful moment, that well done at the end of your days, when you can 
You can hang your hat on a life well invested. You use the gifts that the spirit of God has given you. You capitalized on the opportunity right here, seizing the warnings written to the church by Dietrich Bonhoeffer, seeing the parallels between the 1930s Germany and the socialist trend that arises in modern day America. We will not be a silent church. We will not be cowardly at the redemption church. We will not forsake one iota of the word of God, we will speak on behalf of the lives of the unborn. We will speak in defense of teenagers who suffer from a delusion about their genders. We will speak the truth of God. We will save those being carried off to slaughter. We will proclaim the one gospel that saves the souls of everyone who is currently damned and doomed before the white throne judgment that they would instead stand and receive crowns of life before the Bama seat. This is our commissioning. This is our mission field. This is our opportunity. The most lost city in the US. What are you prepared to do? You've been equipped. You've been gifted. You have the Holy Spirit of God. You have the opportunity. Would you stand before the king when he comes back one day and hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Take a risk, Redemption Church. Risk your finances as you give to the revival project. Risk your time as you invest in people, as you feed the homeless, as you use your gifts. Risk rejection as you share the gospel of Jesus Christ at your workplace and in your family and online. Risk much and receive an incredible heavenly reward. If that wicked, lazy servant thing is a little bit scary to you, I want you to hear these these closing passages. So now, little children, remain in him so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. Second John, verse eight, watch yourselves that you don't lose what we have worked for, but that you may receive a full reward. Revelation three eleven. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one takes your crown. No one is taking my crown. How about you, Redemption Church? Would you stand with us as we close? Because I believe that there are some servants who have been hiding the gospel in a cloth that you have not given your life to Christ. You have not walked with him. You've not used your gifts. You've not done anything for the kingdom of God and your fruitlessness has brought conviction. Today, would you step into repentance brought about by the grace of God? Would you give your life to Jesus Christ? Would you pray with me right now? God, I don't wanna be the wicked, lazy servant. I know that judgment is coming I will stand before you one day, God. And I am afraid that I am the wicked servant. I confess that I have been sinful. I haven't done anything with my life that's of significance, really. I have been wicked. I have been lazy. I have been sinful. I am feel like, Lord, I'm bound before the great white throne judgment that I'm going to stand before you in judgment. I pray, God, Your Holy Spirit's drawing on my heart right now is transformative. I believe the truth about you, Jesus. I confess it. I confess it. Jesus is Lord. Redemption Church, would you say Jesus is Lord? Say it, Jesus is Lord. God, I believe in my heart that you raised Jesus from the dead. Let me be saved, wicked no longer, lazy no longer, a sinner forever no longer. Instead, I am saved, atoned for, paid in full, awaiting that beautiful day where I hear you say, well done, good and faithful servant.